some great visiting speakers and different things that have come up. Um, was it last week that was Mother's Day? Man, it seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, thank God for mothers. We wouldn't be here without them. Uh, we're, we're glad that the pattern that God has given to us. The key verse to uh, the book of 1 Timothy is chapter 3, verse 15. It gives you a, a bird's eye view, you might say, of, of the basic thing he's trying to get across when he says, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's writing, uh, telling them how they are to work together as Christians. You know, some of your Christian life is just you and the Lord. But we're not the Lone Ranger. <laughs> All right, we're not the only one. And God expects to have relationships with other Christians. And the main one is called a church. God's given us the family. God's given us the church. He gives us government. And, you know, there's a lot of patterns that God has put in place. And it's very important for us to follow these as God intends. And when we work together as a church, God will bless you know, we, there's some, some great things that God can do with us together that He can't do with just us alone. Uh, you cannot, as an individual, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. <laughs> you, you know, you can't be in more than one place at a time. But as a church, you can. Uh, we have missionaries that we're supporting who are, are part of our ministry. And we're part of their ministry. And uh, that's, that's what he's talking about here. Great uh, book, as, as every book is. I get excited about every book as I teach it, but... Uh, uh, in, in Timothy, just a little bit of review, in chapter 5, we looked at some things on how to treat people. And basically, if you want to put it in a nutshell, just treat people with respect, really. If they're older than you, if they're younger than you, if they're a mother, if they're a father, just treat them with respect. I was talking to the young people Friday night and, and saying, you know, especially if you don't like them, treat them with respect. <laughs> you know, it, there's a temptation to look down on some people. And to treat them accordingly. Listen, God says that's not the right way. It's not how you want to be treated. Treat people with respect. Um, I don't want to preach another, a different sermon, but in, in Philippians he talks about, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. That's the attitude we should take. A lot of times our, our interpersonal relationships are based on strife and vain glory. I'm better than them. They should listen to me. <laughs> uh, he says, in lowliness of mind, humility. You know, we've made being humiliated a bad word, haven't we? We've made pride a good word. God thinks exactly the opposite. Anyway, I, there's your first sermon. <laughs> uh, he says, treat people with respect. It's very important. Then in chapter 6, we, we looked at how he talks about contentment. Man, that's what we want, isn't it? I think everybody wants to have contentment in their life. But the problem is we go about it, we think, I'll have contentment if I get my way. <laughs> you know, we, we laugh about it in little children, but it's not funny when we get older. Selfishness is never really funny. God's way. Submitting to authority, he talks about. Submitting to the Bible. And, and what a beautiful verse 6 in chapter 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we're going to look today at, at godliness and how, how beautiful it is. Today's message is from uh, verses, chapter 6, verses 11 to 16, mainly. A very simple outline. It's right there in Scripture. Um, flee, follow, fight, and faith. You'll see it as, as we read. So let's, let's start in 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. He starts that 
portion of Scripture there in, in uh, verse 11 with a very, oh, I, don't, I don't know what word to use to describe it, a, a very powerful, I, I guess, expression, O oh, man of God. Wow. If somebody said that about you, would you look around and see who they were talking about? <laughs> oh, man of God. <laughs> Woman of God. It applies to, to all of us. Well, of course, he's, he's talking specifically there. The individual was Timothy. He was a, he was a pastor, young pastor. And, you know, it, it made me stop and, and ask myself, am I a man of God or am I a man of something else? A man of the world. You know, what, would, what would God say to you? What would God say to me? Oh, man of God. Well, to be a man of God, I think these four things we're looking at today are, are essential. The first one there is in uh, verse 11. He says, Thou, O man of God, flee. Flee these things. These things. You know, whenever you see something like that in your Bible, try and figure out what he's talking about. <laughs> flee these things. Okay, what things? Well, he's been given some things there in the, in the, the chapter that we're looking at. The, the, the one just above it there in verses 9 and 10 is the love of money. Listen, Jesus said specifically in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that you cannot serve God and money. You can't be a man of God and live for money. Now, God tells us to work. There, there's no harm in money. It's the, you'll often hear people, the world will say, oh, you know, the love, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with, with money. That money's not the root of all evil. The Bible doesn't say money's the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's the problem. They can show scientifically that people respond to money. <laughs> they did a test where they, they burned money. Oh, people, the things in people's brains just went nuts. <laughs> they valued that. Oh, don't burn it. <laughs> uh, and yet, what is it? Really, the love of money is, is the problem. You cannot serve God in money. Let me read you that verse as Jesus said. It's very plain. Jesus often was. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You look up that word mammon. It means treasure or possession. It doesn't have to be money, just something we value. Flee the love of money. Back in verse 4, if you move up a little bit further, another thing is pride. He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of, of words. Uh, on Wednesday night, this last Wednesday night, we went through Proverbs 13, and one of the verses was, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. When you read your Bible, notice specific words. Only by pride cometh contention. If you're having contentions in your home, it's not because of your humility, all right? It's, uh, it's because of pride. That's what brings contention. He says, if you're going to be a man of God, a person of God, flee pride. Uh, I, I regularly get humiliated. And I have to condition myself to realize that's a good thing. You, you go door knocking. You'll, you'll experience the same thing. People will treat you like you're not even there. <laughs> I remember talking to one guy, and he, he was just acting like I wasn't there. And I finally said, do you speak English? Very well, he said. <laughs> and I went through my mind, oh, you're just rude. <laughs> uh, you know, you'll get humiliated if you serve the Lord. But you know, that's a good thing. Because it's not about us. It's about the Lord. He was humiliated. And we have to flee pride. We have to flee the love of money. Verses 2 and 3, he talks about fleeing unscriptural teaching. Yeah, at the end of verse 2, he says, These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on in the next verse, he's proud. Yeah, we think our words are more important than God's words. The most important part of this sermon this morning is what we read from this book, not what I say about it. And that's important. That's why it's important for you to bring your Bible. Mark your Bible. Listen, I'm on my second layer of, of, uh, of what's this stuff called? Uh, duct, duct tape. You should wear out your Bible. Man, it shouldn't last you more than 10 years unless, unless you start taping it and doing that kind of stuff. Uh, use it because you need to know what God says about things. To be a, a man or woman of God, there are some things you need to know. Man, I don't want that. I need to get away from that. Um, I, I find a, a common enemy we have nowadays is the 
Instant access to every kind of teaching known to man. It's on the internet. <laughs> it's so frustrating as a pastor to, to work your heart out trying to preach the word of God, and people ignore that and they get on the internet and listen to some yehu who's... Some of those guys are in prison. Some of them are, are immoral scuzz bags. But boy, they can, they can present a good message. You need to know the person you're listening to. That's why God gave a local church. He didn't say, uh, you know, that Christ died for the Internet. <laughs> Christ died. Christ loved the church. Gave him, anyway, I don't want to get off on that. Unscriptural teaching. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's things that, are, that we accept just because they're current, just because they're socially acceptable. It's amazing what people will do just because it's done. I was thinking about one. You know, back in the old days, men used to wear these weird wigs. How did that start? And now there's still some in Parliament where they, you know, in the courts, and they'll still put on a wig. You know, come on, get over it. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of weird things that people will do. You, you look back at World War II. How in the world could Japan or Germany do that? It's because they weren't listening to God, of course. But they just, it was the done thing. They were afraid to say no. Listen, be a man, be a woman. Flee when something's wrong. If you're the only one standing with God, you're the one standing in the right place. Amen. Don't be afraid of that. Listen, come judgment day, you'll be glad to stand with the Lord. <laughs> you'll be really glad. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, verses 4 and 5, he, he started the whole book with a warning like this. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. And he says, here's the purpose, what we want to do. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. We need a real faith. And to have that, there's things we can't accept. There's things we need to run from. There's other things listed in the Bible, not just here in, in uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, flee also youthful lusts. You know, when you're 64, you can still have youthful lusts. I've discovered that. <laughs> Yeah, you keep thinking, you get older, you get rid of all these things. Man, it, it doesn't, it, life goes on. Uh, they're worse when you're youth, when you're youthful. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, uh, similar but more specific, he says, flee fornication. You can't be a man or woman of God and be involved in fornication. And he warns, he says, every other sin is outside our body. Fornication is in our, our very body. It's a terrible thing. He says as well in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, flee idolatry. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And you might think, oh, I would never bow down to a, an idol. But listen, anything that comes before God is idolatry. Uh, Jesus needs to have his, his rightful place in our life. He should be more important than any person. He should be more important than any purpose. He should be more important than any possession. Uh, the reason I say that, in, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus talked about discipleship. Really, that's what we're talking about today. Man or woman of God. That's a disciple, a follower of Christ. In, in Luke 14 and, and verse 26, this is a strange verse. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Those are strong words. And what he's saying is, Jesus needs to be more important to you than any person. And let me tell you, you'll have a better marriage if you and your husband or you and your wife both put Jesus first. If you'll get close to the Lord, if both of you will get close to the Lord, it'll bring you closer to each other. It'll give you a better marriage. Being a man or woman of God means Jesus needs to be number one, more than any other person. The next verse, he says, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Christ needs to be more important than any purpose. You, you can get involved in some great purposes in life, can't you? There are some great things. But you know what? None more important than the Lord. The problem is sometimes we, we get off on something and, and we think, this is great. But the problem is it pulls us away from the Lord. We're doing a wonderful thing, but it's not the first thing. Then he says in verse 33 of that chapter, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. 
Christ needs to be more important than any possession. I've often wondered whether we possess things or they possess us. You know, the more you own, uh, the more difficult your life is, really. Uh, God wants us to be men and women of God. In fact, in, in Colossians chapter 3, he gives kind of a, at least a partial definition of, uh, of idolatry. That's, that's where we started here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. I'll read the whole verse. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. He's talking about your, your body. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. That's just a very strong lust. And covetousness, which is idolatry. So it gives a little mini definition there. Covetousness, which, which is idolatry. And it's the same book, Colossians uh, chapter 1, where he says, He, that's Jesus, is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's what we're talking about. No idolatry. Uh, if we're going to be men and women of God, there's some things we have to flee. And idol idolatry is a, it's a difficult one. Because there's so many things in life. There's so many people. There's so many purposes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard not to get caught up in one and, and let it creep ahead of the Lord. We need to do whatever we do for the Lord. Give God His rightful place. Put Jesus first. Probably, probably every one of you know Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We turn it around. We seek the things and say, Lord, you're going to have to take second place. And one of the little kids this morning, it, we give him a, a paper to work on during the week. And, oh, I'm too busy to do that, he said. I said, well, that's, that's a good policy. Always put God last. <laughs> he, sarcasm is wasted on kids. But anyway, uh, you know, we need to give God first place. We need to give him his, his rightful place. How do we do that? Well, one is we flee these things that God says don't to do. But the other is we follow him. That's the next point there in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 11, Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after. And then he gives a list of several things here. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know, just as important as what you don't do is what you do. You know, for some people, being a Christian is, I don't do this and I don't do that. <laughs> I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with the girls who do, you know, I used to say. Uh, it's not just what you don't do, it's what you do as well. If I had to value the two, I, I don't know if, if one is more important than the other, but I would say what you do is probably more important than what you don't do because you'll get so busy doing what you're doing that you won't do the others anyway. probably mostly has to do with your actions, and godliness has to do with the, your motive for doing it. Follow righteousness, godliness, you know, being right. Uh, back in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, verse 7, he says, Refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness profiteth unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I, I exercise. Probably most of you do, too. It, it can have some value. But you know what? Godliness will not only have value now, it'll have value for eternity. Exercise doesn't. I can't say whether we'll exercise in eternity. I kind of don't think we will, but I hope we don't. <laughs> anyway, but he says here, godliness profits now and in eternity. Righteousness, godliness. And then later on he says in chapter 6, verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. What a blessing to have godliness with content, contentment. Later on in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, he talks about people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Man, that's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who talk godliness. They say they're godly, but, but they're not. It's not the Lord that they're following. You know, a lot of religion is selfish. People want to feel good about themselves. And uh, Christianity is not like religion. 
But we don't just get into Christianity to feel good about ourselves. And you know, the Lord, Lord will bless you, and there's a lot of good, uh, good feelings in, in Christianity, but uh, we, need, we need to be careful that we're not just in a selfish, phony kind of godliness. It needs to be real. And then he talks about faith. You know, the Bible tells us to walk by faith, not by sight. He says the just shall live by faith. And the question oftentimes that we need to answer, is this by faith? As you're, as you're living your life, ask yourself, is this by faith? In other words, is, is this what God would have me to do? But by doing this, will I, will I follow God? What does God say? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That's what it's all about. He says to follow love. You know, we all like love. We all like the idea of love. We don't always like what it really means. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Wow, he gave his best to die. Love is, is important. In, in Ephesians 4.15, he talks about speaking the truth in love. You know, a lot of times we think, I'll, I'll love somebody by just ignoring their problem. Listen, if you love them, you'll, you'll help them with the problem many times. Speak the truth in love. The problem then is, is we wait and we get so mad that then we explode. And we explode all over them instead of speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4 and verse 2, he said, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. I am so grateful and glad that there are people who love me enough to put up with me. That's what forbearing is. I, I was an adult before I realized that most of the time when you love somebody, it's not because of how great they are. It's in spite of how bad they are. <laughs> you ever thought about that? We think of that with others. Have you ever thought about it with yourself? There's people who put up with you. Praise God. Man, they do with me too. I won't go into my bad habits, but anyway. Uh, love, it, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, later on there in Ephesians 5 and verse 2, he says, Walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us. Uh, we have a great example. He, he then goes on in 1 Timothy 6. Uh, we've, we've looked at quite a few things here. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love. Ooh, here's a problem. Patience. Give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> uh, patience is a difficult one. One of the things he talks about, I think it's First Thess or Second Thessalonians 3, 5. He says, we need to be patient to the coming of the Lord. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Jesus is coming again. Be patient. He is coming. It'll be just like he said. In um, Romans 15, 5, here, here's the blessing of patience. Our God is the God of patience. That's what it says in Romans 15, 5. God is very patient. The God of patience and consolation. Man, those are two great things. That's our God. Sometimes you'll read in the scripture of God destroying a nation. Yeah, you've read it. The world loves to ridicule it. Do you know that usually it's after like four or 500 years that God does that? God pleads with them. God sends messengers. God deals with them. I mean, really. You know, you tell your kid, go clean your room. 500 years later, <laughs> no, God's very patient. Aren't you glad? He's patient with you, and he's, he's coming again. He's the God of, of patience and consolation. He says to follow after as well meekness. I don't think anybody really likes meekness. Meekness is strength under control. We like to be like the Incredible Hulk, you know. We like to have something, boy, we, we deal with it. We, we get after it. God says meekness. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We, we love it when people are merciful and kind to us, but boy, we're, we're very dogmatic when it's somebody else in trouble. Uh, we need to follow Jesus is what he's saying here. There's things we need to flee. There's things we need to follow. And then in verse 12 of, of 1 Timothy 6, he says, fight the good fight of faith. I remember one lady some years ago, she said, why do we sing onward Christian soldiers? She said, I didn't think Christians were supposed to fight. <laughs> well, we're not supposed to fight like, you know, like bash each other up really, but uh, we are to stand for the Lord. We need to know whose side we're on. 
That's important. Verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Later on in verse 20, he uses a, a word, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That word keep is, is like a guard. That's a military thing, isn't it? They set up a guard. That guard has a responsibility, like a soldier. Uh, later in, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, very specifically, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Listen, this life is not all, all there is. This is not the main event. Eternity. That's what we're living for. We need to fight the good fight of faith. In, in Jude, he says, earnestly contend for the faith. That word contend is combat. We need to stand for the Lord. Uh, in, in a fight, it makes a difference which side you're on. Man of God or man of, you know, which, which side are you on? God describes this fleeing and following and, and fighting as laying hold on eternal life. That's the expression he uses there. What is it? Verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life. That's what God wants you to do. Now, if you're saved, you're going to live with the Lord for eternity. He says, lay hold of it. Get a hold of the life that you have in Christ. Live it now. You know, be a person who, who lives for eternity. The Christian life is actually very practical. You know, th there's a lot of religion. Some of it claims to be Christian, but they've made it mystical. They've made it very impractical. Christianity is very practical. I mean, it's, it, like one man said, it's where the rubber hits the road. I mean, it, it's what, how we live. Uh, look at verse 17. This is, this is an area of where he just talks about the practicality. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. I mean, what's the temptation when you have plenty of money? Think you're better than other people and trust in your money. He says, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good. You know, God's blessed you, do good with it. That they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Both those words have to do with finances and, and physical things. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. He's saying, live your life on purpose. Lay hold on eternal life. Don't just live. Live for eternity. Live for God. What a blessing. Uh, make it the practice of your life. So the man of God is made up of what he flees from. He's made up of what he follows after, what he fights for, and what's important to us. He also for what he's faithful to. Verses 13 and 14, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, and then it talks about Christ's testimony, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be faithful. Not only do right, keep doing right. Just keep trusting the Lord. He, he says there in, in verse 14 that thou keep this commandment. Commandment. <laughs> you understand that word? Uh, you know, you talk to kids. You say, do this. I, I remember my dad saying, uh, uh, would you like to go and do this? I said, no, not really. He said, well, I wasn't really asking. <laughs> you know, God tells us things. We need to understand. God has the right to tell us things. It's a commandment. And here's the key. Look if, if you have your Bible there. Hebrews 10 verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. You say, well, this is not in 1 Timothy. Well, it's in the Bible. It's God's word. Hebrews 10 verse 23. You can look at the whole chapter. A great, great chapter in God's word. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Okay, there's God's instruction to us. Here's the reason we can't. For he is faithful that promised. That's the key to the Christian life. It's not you. It's not me. It's the Lord. God is faithful. We're really going to look at that tonight. I, I hope you won't miss. First, First Timothy 5, he says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Listen, God doesn't call you to do something and leave you alone. He goes with you. You have his promise. He'll never leave you or forsake you. 
in that verse first that I quoted there, 1 Thessalonians 5, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Did you notice the first important part of that? He calls you. You have to respond to his call. This faithful God. It just amazes me to think that God made the world knowing we would sin and that he would have to come and die for our sins. That, that's incredible. You know, if you had the opportunity of a relationship and you could see into the future and you knew that they were going to torture you and shoot you, you probably wouldn't enter into that relationship. <laughs> but, you know, God knew exactly what we were going to do. And he provided the, the cure, the remedy, because he loves us. God's call. Have you responded to God's call? That's where it starts. Faithful is he that, who calleth you, who also will do it. You start a relationship with God by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Well, you might ask, well, faith, what, what am I supposed to believe? The Philippian jailer was uh, troubled, and he called out to the disciples, what must I do to be saved? You notice he said, what must I do? That's typical, isn't it? We think, what can I do? You know, their answer was believe. They didn't say, oh, do this, do this. Join our church, get baptized, pay me $500, drachma or whatever they had. Uh, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by faith. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. What to believe? Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to believe the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. We need to believe God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This is how we know the truth. God has revealed himself to us. That's amazing. You start a relationship with God by faith. You respond to his call. You have his guarantee he'll be faithful. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, I'm glad my salvation isn't dependent upon me and my character. I have to be hidden in Christ for, God, for me to be acceptable to God. And you know what? You also continue a relationship with God by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our walk. Let me give you a little encouraging verse before we quit here. It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God, if you're saved, if you've responded to God's call, been saved, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. There's victory in Jesus. God has a purpose for you. God has a plan. And God wants you to know him. And when you know him, you, you have to come to him by faith. He wants you to continue living by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. We're going to take our, our song books this, this morning and look at a song. I, I think we know it pretty well. It's Living by Faith. It's page 34. I thought we'd, we'd end with this song this morning.